So hello, if, if nobody caught me off the top of the uh, the introductions for the session today, uh, my name is Brett Hodes. I'm the senior program manager uh, at Tech Nation on uh, our future workforce development team. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to be moderating this panel today. On, we'll be here to discuss the, the proven potential of project-based learning, or we might, we might condense that in our short time to PBLs today. Um, and I'm super excited to, to bring this panel on, on PBL because I think it's an important conversation to have that may sometimes kind of get overlooked when we talk about Will. And, uh, and we'll discuss sort of why, but, but overall, I think it deserves some attention. So here we are. Uh, I, made, I made the panelists do it. <laughs> and, um, you know, especially when, when, when and where we're talking about trying new things and being innovative, I really just want to make sure that we have these kinds of conversations as well. And I'm equally excited because we had a, a, a couple last minute folks join us, and in particular, a brave student to step forward. Uh, just this morning to, to join the panel. So kudos to Alex, who we're going to hear from in a moment. He's a total rock star, and word on the street is that he might be graduating and looking for employment soon. So no pressure, Alex, but there's uh, a lot of industry in the session today. So oh, maybe make, a bit of pressure. It's fine. <laughs> we'll give you an opportunity to plug yourself. So without any further ado, um, maybe we could just start with Annie, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself, your role, and your organization. Hi everyone, my name is Annie. I'm the founder and CEO at My Travel, which is essentially is building the first student-facing all travel solution for study, study abroad students to plan and manage their travels. Um, I'm actually a graduate student of not too long ago. I graduated from SVBD back in 2019. So I'm coming from a perspective of both someone that's been through PBL from a student perspective, as well as someone that's been through PBL from an employer perspective, since I've been working with Dana from Ripen, as well as Amazing Ripen team in getting new students to help on, on our current platform of my travel. So very excited to share with you today about my experiences from both sides and give you some perspective there. Fabulous. Uh, over to you, Dana. Perfect. Uh, first off, I just want to thank you for having me. Uh, this event has been incredibly inspiring and such an, an important topic that uh, I'm, of course, incredibly passionate about. Uh, and secondly, I just I also want to echo your comments um, and just uh, make a big uh, fist pump to Alex for joining us today. Um, it's so important to get the students' perspective into the room. And as we just heard, having you know Annie's student to then graduate to employer perspective is also incredibly valuable. So. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, my name is Dana Stevenson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ripen. Um, for those of you that don't know, Ripen is an online marketplace that enables uh, education and training providers to provide high quality, high impact, uh, work integrated experiential learning uh, at scale. That's what we really you know, focus on is doing this at scale while, while maintaining high quality. Um, we do this mainly through project-based learning, um, PBL, uh, but also more recently through project-based remote internship programs. Um, through this model, we basically connect colleges and universities to employers to bring uh, more real world learning opportunities to students uh, early on and throughout their entire education pathway. Um, so it's really about increasing access, uh, especially to those who might not know really have access to these types of, of opportunities. Uh, I'm sure we'll be getting this in a second, but really what we're all about here is students getting experience, gaining career clarity, getting the job ready skills to land the jobs they love. And also on the company side, they're gaining fresh insights to build and diversify uh, their talent pipeline for upcoming roles in the organization. So thank you for having me. Pleasure. Over to you, Christine. Thanks, Brett. And thanks, uh, Tech Nation, for organizing this event today. Um, whenever I kind of speak about work integrated learning, I usually end up putting on two different hats, but I'll, I'll tell you about the day job one that pays the bills first. So I'm the director of co-op career and work integrated learning at Conestoga College. So my teams are the people that help support all of the transitions to employment that our students um, and our graduates and our community members are involved in. So whether that's co-op or field placements or um, you know, graduate employment opportunities, um, they help facilitate that. Uh, and as some of you on this, uh, this session might even be familiar with some of the team, people like Kitty Renstetler, who are there to support employers and uh, help connect talent to, uh, to our students. And um, the other hat that I typically wear is uh, I'm past president of Seawill Canada. And Seawill is the 
Canadian Association for Co-op and Work Integrated Learning. So a Canada's national body that supports co-op and work integrated learning. And um, and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of Siebel's role in helping to support the, the WILL ecosystem, but uh, I love to be able to, to wear both hats. And, and they both look so great <laughs> and you do it so well. Thank you so much. And uh, and over to Alex too, and, and maybe you could just sort of tell us a little bit about what program you're in or, you know, what finished your co-op program and uh, what you're looking forward to. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I'm Alex Kozak. Uh, I've been at Conestoga since January of 2018. Uh, it was a um, in the software engineering program and I spent, uh, it was something like 16 months doing school and then 16 months doing co-op. So I've had uh, a number of different jobs, different hats, not quite as big of a hat, but there are there. Uh, so at the moment I'm finishing up my last four months, just kind of flowing my way through and then looking towards the job market on the other side. Uh, some of the co-op placements that I ended up going with uh, offered me part-time employment throughout the school term. So I've been helping them out in a, in a more part-time capacity, but we're getting things done. So keeping me busy as time goes on. So I'm glad I could show up and give some kind of a perspective, even though I, I have no, I have no polished anything. I showed up today just, with whatever I've got. So you're going to have to deal with whatever comes out. You're already doing great. Thanks so much, Alex. So I want to do a little bit of context setting and hopefully I'm not on mute. Okay, I'm not. That's good. Uh, we're off to a good start. And I just sort of want to talk or, or establish, you know, a little bit of, you know, some definitions or parameters. So, you know, Christine, I, I've got to pick on you. you got to, I got to lean on you a little bit. Tell us about PBL. Tell us about field placements, applied research projects, et cetera, and how do they differ? Sure. Thanks, Brett. Um, and, you know, for, you know, the, the academic types that might be in the room, you know, Seawill, uh, you know, has identified kind of nine different types of work integrated learning. And some of those are types that are, you know, more familiar to, to many, which is, you know, typical, you know, type of work integrated learning that most organizations are familiar with is co-op, you know, and that's, you know, in Canada, it's paid employment, it's full time, it's generally, you know, for four months uh, at a time, and it might be rotating between school and work, or it might be like in Alex, Alex's program, a co-op internship model where there might be you know, two, three, or four, uh, four month work terms back to back. And, you know, I think, you know, again, lots of employers have participated um, in, in co-op, um, but there's lots of other ways to, that you can get involved in work integrated learning. And some of those other ways are maybe le considered less intense or, um, maybe even less, you know, scary, uh, less commitment, um, and certainly less cost. And, um, and so some of those types of work integrated learning would be, you know, Brett has described it as project based learning. Um, you know, at Conestoga, we call it um, industry sponsored projects. Um, you'll hear capstone projects. And it's really classroom based work integrated learning where you still have the key partners of the student, the academic institution, um, and an industry partner, um, but it might be, uh, you know, a, a single project that they're working on. Um, and we'll talk, we're going to talk more about project based learning. So I'm not going to like speak as much about that right now, but you know, another, you know, type of work integrated learning that you might be thinking about is like field placements. So that's when students might go out for one day a week or for a six week block. Um, we talk about service learning. So these are often projects that are really more focused on the not-for-profits um, and where students are really gaining that opportunity to learn about giving back. Um, and then, you know, you might have entrepreneurial work integrated learning. And it sounds like Annie, maybe, you know, you might have been engaged a little bit in that if perhaps you launched your business um, out of an idea that might have been supported through a campus incubator, possibly, um, you know, that's another type of work integrated learning um, and applied research and applied research and project based learning might often be used interchangeably. So that's something to to note that, you know, um, it may in fact be that this industry project um, is part of an applied research project is that the industry member is partnering with the institution on and they're gaining kind of talent, student talent to help uh, fulfill that project. Um, or it might just be, uh, you know, a single project not connected to a bigger initiative um, and, you know, present it to a class and, and you've got eager students who are able to work on that project. 
Fabulous. Yeah. And you brought up a couple of good points. I mean, especially some of these, you know, different vehicles are kind of, you know, there's less cost associated with them. So they're a little bit more, you know, easier to participate in, or there's less barriers, especially, you know, Tech Nation and the Career Ready Program. We're working with a ton of, you know, SMEs, startup scale. It's very young entrepreneurs, sometimes an entrepreneur who's just graduated, you know, any and who started their own business, and you don't really have a ton of resources. And so sometimes we see, you know, uh, requests for funding come in, and you can kind of tell in the background, or you can see the story. You know, this employer, you know, saved up all their money, or they got a loan, and they're working really hard, and they want to have a student come in for like, you know, kind of a five-week placement. And so I see those come in, and we certainly do fund them uh, through through the Career Ready program. But I always wonder if. If a, if a PBL might better satisfy them. And uh, so we're maybe even doing them a disservice by funding the position when there's these other sort of models that might serve them better. And um, and so that's why I kind of almost call like PBL or some of these other kind of types of will, almost like like gateway will, you know, working up to kind of these co-op placements. So, um, so a lot of us are here to sort of talk about will. Why do you think uh, PBL is, is relevant here, Christine? Yeah, I mean, and Dana, you know, in his intro, he kind of quickly touched on a few points because I think, you know, and he think he really hit on kind of some of the high parts right away. Um, you know, I think all forms of work integrated learning are really an amazing opportunity from the industry perspective to build their talent pipeline. Um, you know, it might be a, um, a project length uh, job interview, it might be a field placement length job interview, or it might be a four month or 16 month uh, length job interview. But it's an opportunity to really kind of try out talent and the students from that perspective as well, they get to try out the company. And, and you know, that's something employers do need to remember that, you know, uh, when you are participating in any form of work integrated learning, you know, hopefully you're looking at, you know, the students as an opportunity, you know, part of your talent pipeline. But if you are, then you need to make sure you're putting your best face forward as well so that the student has a good experience and has a good, uh, you know, experience working with you as an organization and that they would want to go back. So the talent pipeline, um, for sure. Um, the idea of kind of gateway will, that's, a, I, I think, a, a, an interesting way to describe it, but it's a, it's a good one. And we see it. We see success stories where, you know, students, they start with a project. And that leads into them getting an offer for co-op and that leads into them getting an offer for graduate employment. And then like when it's really full circle, they come back and like Annie and then they participate and they hire the next kind of generation of students. Um, and then the last one, I would say, you know, the, that low cost way um, that you mentioned, but finally being able to access this fresh talent and these fresh ideas like, um, you know, and it's and it's it's really easy, especially once employers, I think, get, you know, into the groove of how to participate. I think um, they'll find that it's a really kind of great addition to um, their activities. Thank you for that. So next, I kind of wanted to jump into, you know, your programming models and methodologies, both from sort of, you know, the, the academia side and the industry side. So how is this sort of organized between you guys and, and organized with the teachers and, and what are the relations there? And are, are the projects kind of, are they pulled off the shelf? Are they kind of more industry design? How does that whole piece work? And, and maybe we'll go over to Dana to kick. I just, I just want to bring back the comment around gateway will because I, 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 I enjoy that comment and I, and I think it's uh, it's an important comment because it's it's not just gateway will for the students but we see students starting with lower intensity projects earlier on and starting to stack you know higher intensity projects that might have more autonomy as they as they, as they continue to grow grow and, and, and learn more and, and develop the skills and and um, of course, this can lead to um, more uh, traditional full-time will placements uh, like Alex is participating in. But it's also the gateway for the employers as well. There are so many small, medium organizations. I think that's what you're touching on there, Brett. There are small, medium organizations, startups, not-for-profits, where they just haven't engaged with students yet. And whether that's because they think of it as too risky or they don't know where to start or you know, maybe they're waiting for some other organization to give the students experience first before hiring them. This becomes a really good stepping stone for them to get in, uh, engage with students, um, you know, get exposed to the talent and the types of skills and, and what they're learning. Um, and that starts to make them more comfortable and confident in becoming a, a you know, really active, uh, you know, work integrated learning employer. 
Um, I can talk a little bit about, so just to, to sorry, I just want to mention that. So on, on, your, on your question, what's really interesting, um, you know, how we do this at Ripen is, you know, really the ecosystem is educator driven uh, in a sense that where, you know, what, uh, the educators, whether that's your services, whether that's instructors or professors, they're done designing experiences and they're making sure that they're setting out the right expectations, the right type of projects that are going to align with the learning objectives of the program. So it really needs to be an authentic learning experience. On the flip side of it, we call it industry design. The projects are all industry design. So they're trying to make sure the projects align with their business and talent needs. And um, they're, you know, their uh, you know, new ideas that they're um, exploring or innovating on. But really, what we end up doing in our in, in the ripen world is we connect the two together, um, and that creates a co-creation co opportunity. So we help connect the educators to the employers, help get them sort of speaking the same language, um, and then once those connections are made, there's an opportunity for a co-creation. So those, those the projects might be adapted really to ensure that again it aligns with both the business and talent needs and aligns with the, the learning objectives of the program. And what's really exciting about this model is that. And I, I, I often talk about this is that it actually creates a co-learning experience. So, you know, again, a lot of, you know, learn, we, we talk a lot about writing that learning goes both ways. And the, you know, as much as the organizations are mentoring the students through these, through these project-based opportunities, the students are, are, are um, bringing fresh insights. They're bringing what they're learning in the classroom and applying that in the real world setting. And a lot of the organizations are attracted to this because they get to actually go down that journey with the student and they get involved experience and that helps them innovate that helps them you know, go through digital transformation which is so common right now uh, really bringing in that student perspective right and uh, I just wanted to ask Christine did you have anything kind of to add from the academia side yeah I mean I think uh, you know much like Dana said, I mean, I think it, it typically the best projects are, are going to be uh, to, to come forward when they are co-created. You know, it has to be a fit for both the um, the academic program that the, the project is embedded in, and it has to be a fit for the employer partner. If it doesn't fit for one or the other, then, it, you know, it's not going to work very well. And so, you know, how does that happen? Um, it happens when the industry partner and typically the faculty member are talking to each other. They're making sure that they're setting expectations. So things that they're setting expectations about would be that the, the project is being matched with the right program, the right course, and that the students have learned the right skills to be able to complete the project that's being brought forward that it's at the right level. You know, is this for a first year, you know, as Dana mentioned, is this a first year project or is this a final year capstone project that, you know, is culminating all the, you know, knowledge they've gained in their, in their program. And it's also about setting expectations for um, the employer partner that, you know, in the end, these are still students, you know, and they're going to do their best student work, but that some project results might be better quality than others. And, you know, setting expectations for what the outcome and, and how it can be used and maybe immediately commercialized, you know, that needs to be something that is clearly kind of understood and identified. And so really, um, you know, I think they're, they're often kind of custom designed. Sometimes they're kind of repeat projects, but there's always got to be really good communication. I like that answer. And I was even going to kind of ask, you, you know, what kind of investments, you know, in terms of time do, do employers have to make? Is it very high touch? But it sort of sounds, I like that answer. It depends. It can be, but there's a lot of sort of supports and services out there that, that, that kind of, you know, reduce churn or, or make it easier to access. So I think that's awesome. I kind of want to switch a little bit now, and I just sort of wanted to ask maybe Alex, we can start with you. Like, what what is your experience with PBL been like? How do you see it from your perspective? And and what has made a good project for you? What what was what made it good? Yeah. So as far as I've I've uh, experienced with with those, uh, it was with with a uh, four by four project, which is our essential. We took a week uh, during our March break, our our uh, reading week term in the spring semester. And what we do is we bring in a bunch of industry partners and they pitch their ideas to a bunch of different groups of various levels. And so at that point, it's just a bunch of people coming together with ideas and people coming together who want to showcase their skills that they've been developing over these past couple months in order to create something. So it isn't necessarily going to be something fully finished because it's a week. You got to expect what you can expect from what's going to come out of it. But I've seen a, a number of things come out 
uh, with companies who have come in and asked for stuff to get done and really interesting <laughs> ideas have come through uh, with with ideas coming out because I, I know a lot of people, especially uh, with with the co-op terms that are that come up, people really need to have some form of portfolio and they love having the ability to have somebody else come up with an idea for them because that usually ends up being the most difficult part. And if we can put our effort more controlled into some, somebody else's idea, that would be almost ideal for a number of the people who are in my program or other programs like it. Are you sure you didn't prepare? <laughs> that was Not awesome. at all. <laughs> that was excellent. Annie, how about you from your perspective on either end? Absolutely. So I guess starting from the students and similar to Alex, I've also been through different like co-ops, internships, as well as like PBL like opportunities, whether it's on Grappin or through Discord channels. And a lot of the, a lot of the best projects really come from getting expectations set at the early get go, like whether or not this is going to be an introductory type of project or is it going to be a capstone project. Having those initial conversation with the employer and the student is super helpful because we know what to expect at the end of the day. And we know what type of opportunities and what type of skills that we should be bringing to this project and not take those ones that might be too outside of our skill sets, but just a little bit outside our own comfort zone. Assessment just said, it's also a great way in terms of the employers. I know sometimes coming from the employer background, whether you're a small business, NFP, or even just an early stage entrepreneur, you might always have that initial concern about, oh, if you work with students, where they have the right skill sets, or it will take a lot of time to train. But something that we realize is that it's actually great working with students because they're essentially like a blank canvas. It makes training a lot easier because they're not coming in with tons of experiences and tons of different like knowledge expertise, but they're willing to be more open and they're more flexible to learning like our own company's tax stacks, whether it's using React, we're using certain type of programming, um, Figma, et cetera. We have like, our own tools and they're more open to approaching that and just taking that on as opposed to us having to train some that's super skilled and trying to go back to the way that we want to work properly. So I think working with a blank cap is really helpful in that case. Aside from just that, um, a quick example that I use in reference blog posts is we actually hosted a design challenge for our recent conference sponsorship with Isaac students, where we hosted a design challenge for students to initially use what we taught them in the workshop to create a mini um, design idea for my travel. And something that the students actually came up with is actually things beyond what we were initially like kind of going towards, but it actually brings in more perspective and something that's more related to our student demographic, right? So they just bring a lot of different perspective that Sometimes you may not know yourself as an employer and it might be a ton of vision and idea, but students are a great way to just utilize their experience and skill sets in that regards. Um, aside from just those two, I actually would say like for us at My Travel, the way that we work with students is we usually have like an onboarding, um, sorry, just got chat try. We usually have an onboarding day where we just take in all the students that we are working PBL in the PBL setting with. So let them know like, how MyTrial works as a company, which we do iterate in the interview process, but let them know like, how MyTrial works as a company and then what we expect from them as students and how we can communicate and what's the best like many milestones that they can achieve to make sure that they are working towards the goal and they are learning throughout the process, but also making sure that as employee, we are training them and we are providing them mentorship because at the end of the day, we also want the students who want to work with us in a long-term setting, even after the PBL is over, right? Because at the end of the day that we're spending time training them, we do want to keep the talent but it's also like students want to be able to use that eight weeks or three months however long that like PBL period is so you're also using that to vet whether, the, whether or not the company is the right choice for them and whether or not they want to stay in the company even on a part-time basis like what Alex has done earlier or maybe on the full-time capacity too so just giving that type of um, opportunity just fit on both sides as employer as well as students super helpful to see if there's any future opportunities to work together in a more longer capacity. Yeah, and I hear what you just said too about, you know, just having that fresh set of eyes or perspective, like that's something that comes up a lot and that's a huge value proposition of participating in something like this. And, you know, especially if you're maybe in an office where everyone's maybe of the same generation, uh, you know, you wanna kind of even a different generational perspective or lens, even me as a millennial, I mean, sometimes I don't even know what Gen Z's, you know, are kind of thinking. So I think that's a really great kind of way to leverage uh, something like this. I just kind of want to go back a, a moment back to Dana and, and, and Christine and something uh, Julie actually brought it up in the chat and great minds think alike because I was just going to ask this question. People are wondering and, and certainly I am too, what about the matching process? Like how does that work with, with your programming at, at the school and, and through uh, Ripen's platform? 
I, I can speak to how, how it ripes, works at Ripen. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we learned really early on, um, you know, we're, we're uh, is that, you know, every academic institution uh, is very unique and their students are unique. And um, this is part of the why we do the education. Um, so really with our ecosystem, by the way, one of the things I always like to share is it truly is sort of our, our, our secret, but not so secret sauce really is that we made a very intentional decision early on that it's an open and shared collaborative ecosystem. So, you know, anyone can actually go on there and without logging, even logging in or signing up, you can see examples of how our partners are engaging with each other, what types of projects they're launching on the academic side, what types of open calls for projects or uh, courses they're launching. And this has really become a you know a community of practice. This is an area where you know you can connect with others, you can learn and see what others in the community are, are engaging in. Those all become open and educational shared resources for the rest of the community. Uh, and it's really just become the, the largest and fastest growing template library uh, for, for project-based learning in, in, in the world. So it's a great resource. Hope you can take advantage of it. But that resource also really is the marketplace. So on one side, the projects are being posted by the organizations. We use matchmaking algorithms. We've got a team behind the scenes that are also trying to make do you know manual matching. Uh, we provide a lot of service, really support getting the right organizations with the right expectations to the right uh, educators and, and, and vice versa. Once those matches are made, it really depends on how, again, Every instructor is unique and the way they want to run their courses is, is unique. So we offer a huge amount of customizability of whether they want to run it with just one organization for the entire class and students will be working on a similar project facilitated by the educator. Often this is for earlier, you know, earlier year uh, courses um, or whether that's a large project from an organization that's been split up into multiple pieces and the students can identify which project best aligns with their, their career interests and their aspirations and they can form groups and, 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 and take a piece of the project. You go all the way up to the more higher intensity projects, often the capstone projects, and often this is multiple organizations. You know, you might have 50 or 60 students in a class and those are gonna be split, split into 12 groups. You know, I mean, the, the educator will wanna have, you know, 15 or 20 different projects submitted by, by employers. And that gives a, a wide variety of organizations to choose from. So students, once again, can uh, indicate which projects they're most interested in, which best align with their skill set, uh, their career interests, what they want to explore, and they can form groups. And eventually the, the educator will, will make the final call on which students are working with which employers. So, you know, I think much of what Dana has said, while like applicable to how um, the Ripen platform works, like some of the, you know, most of those core elements are um, going to be found in terms of, you know, how ever, you know, project-based learning is happening. And, you know, his comment that, you know, every institution is different, you know, he's right. Um, you know, we all have our, you know, it really it's, and it's not just every institution, it's really, really gets down to, you know, every course, every faculty member, you know, operates, you know, project-based learning a little bit differently. And, you know, I noticed there was a question saying, is this just in the STEM fields? And no, absolutely not. Um, a ton of project-based learning in um, our kind of school of business area, creative industries, um, certainly in, you know, our IT area. Um, and I think what you've seen in the last couple of years is kind of an explosion of work integrated learning at colleges and universities. Um, but, uh, and I should have said, you know, at universities, because it certainly has exploded over the last few years. Colleges have been doing a really, you know, hands-on style of learning for a, a long, long time. So at Conestoga, we've been doing project-based learning for, you know, years and years and years. And so have kind of developed a system for how, you know, how that works for us. And we often run something um, that we call pitch days. Um, and um, these would typically be for, you know, some of the, you know, the more upper year projects, like what, you know, Dana was mentioning, where you need multiple unique projects so that each you know senior group of students has their own project to work on um, and uh, you know really it's you often have you know employers that want to come back you know year over year term over term and participate and get that you know new talent but you also want to give students a chance to pick a project that best aligns with their future you know goals maybe they they want to go on to grad school and so they pick a project that kind of aligns with you know that background maybe there's a certain industry that they want to get into and so they want to pick a project that aligns with them and so these you know industry partners will come in and basically 
pitch their idea. It's like a reverse dragon's den, only the students are in, in control because uh, in advance, the faculty member will have ensured that the projects are appropriate to level, appropriate to course. And that's that relationship that takes place. Keep, you know, give the employer partner some hints on, you know, what to present. And then it's pitched to the students and the students get to kind of have a voice and really kind of upvote what's the most popular project. And then, you know, employers learn. They learn how to pitch to students. So it is about that learning both ways. So that's just one way that it can take place um, in terms of the matching. Thank you for sharing. And, you know, on that note of, um, thanks for addressing that question that came up in the chat too. Something else that's really interesting, and we're having tons of conversations about it from a programming perspective is, you know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, as we sort of transition more into sort of this, you know, skills-based workforce, skills-based economy, we're starting to actually see a lot of tech companies that, that hire techies, you know, hardcore stemmers, and they're actually missing that, that, that critical perspective of arts and humanities. And so we're actually seeing uh, companies that I think is really quite smart and innovative. They're actually looking to hire, you know, maybe like, you know, one or two business analysts who went through kind of like, you know, a, a business technology management program, two of them, but maybe one of them comes actually from political science or something. And, um, and I think it's, that's really valuable to, to like, we talked about fresh perspectives not only you know, cross-culturally, but also through different you know, um, academic disciplines as well. Super, super valuable. Um, so another question I, I had, and maybe I'll kind of lean on, on Team Conestoga for this one, was I wanted to talk or ask you about, you know, what are some of the benefits of PBL for students beyond kind of the academics? Alex, why don't you share what you think the benefit is? And I can fill in any gaps maybe that we see. Sure. Uh, yeah, I can I can talk some at least about my experience with it. Uh, it really, like I mentioned earlier, provides a direction uh, because we we spend so much time gathering these skills in order to create something. And when the something doesn't exist, you can't put those skills to use. And so with these things, like in the 4x4 and the capstone, uh, as previously mentioned with the pitch day, my my situation was a little weirder because COVID happened and everybody stopped. Um, so it's a little different for us. So we had just text, text documents sent around saying, hey, if you want to do these cool things that we have, you can pick them up. Uh, but I know uh, through a number of other students who have been been here previously that they, they said the pitch days were some of the more interesting days because you get to go through and see so many of these different ideas that you didn't even think of. Like, especially around this area with so many different uh, startups just going in and out, uh, creating new interesting things all the time. There's so many different perspectives that you don't even know about that just show up and then display something that you were like, oh, this is this is suddenly new to me. I'm, I'm very interested in this thing. And that really helps us at least uh, find a direction for our careers in, in the future with that. So I think, you know, Alex kind of touched on something that Dana mentioned earlier, which was uh, career, career clarity. Um, and, you know, all forms of work integrated learning, I think, provide an excellent opportunity to help students develop that career clarity. So whether it's about what industry is a fit for them or what, you know, type of employer, what type of work they want to do, um, you know, it gives them that taste to, to get that career clarity. Um, and I mean, the opportunity to network and, you know, unfortunately, Alex, you know, during COVID, the networking opportunities, you know, aren't as great as, you know, sometimes when they are, when you've got an in-person pitch day and you know, you've got a an in-person event where you're, you know, you're presenting your plans and then company, you know, leaders are coming in, you know, maybe checking things out. And, and I certainly agree. I hope we get to the point where we can get back to that soon. Um, but, you know, those are, you know, some of the opportunities. One of the things that Conestoga did uh, this year was we launched something called the Student Experiential Record. Um, and this is kind of like a, a portfolio for all of the experiential learning that students are gaining in their academic program. It kind of pulls it into one place because what we were finding was that there was really, um, uh, you know, 
you hear about this challenge of, you know, uh, an employer is posting for a new grad opportunity and they're looking for someone with three years of experience. And then the, the new grad wants to apply to this new grad opportunity and they say, but I don't have three years of experience. I'm a new grad. And how do you, you know, bridge that gap? And what we started to realize, well, if you add up all of the time the students spend in their co-op, in their field placement, doing project-based learning, doing hands-on, you know, experiential learning, you know, uh, you know, especially in the college system, you know, it adds up, you know, they might actually have a year of experience or a year and a half of experience. And it builds that confidence for the student to understand that, yeah, I'm bringing something of value to the employer right away. And it helps them learn how to articulate that to employers. And that's half the battle. You know, I always wonder, you know, is it a skills gap or is it a skills articulation gap? And, you know, hopefully this does just a little bit to help students find the language and the words that they need to describe to employers and events like this hopefully are great for employers to start to understand that you know these types of experiences are real experiences and really should be counted um, and you know when you see a new grad you need to think about the fact that they're you know they're not as green as you think they are anymore because they've had these real life experiences that maybe you know 10 or 15 years ago weren't as available in post-secondary education be counted and in many cases should be paid paid as well I, and I know that's something uh, Dana is quite committed about as well so we're, I've just gone this end of time but we're coming up to the end of our 45 minutes so I wanted to let everybody kind of have a last word how can folks there's a lot of interest in that and I know people are interested how can folks continue to get, get involved or, or learn more than every one of you Dana I'll start with you. sure um uh, I just want to take one quick second to say one thing, though, because it was really interesting. About, you know, okay. I think everyone really touched on here was just the 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 also I think the benefit here to students is is, is is building social capital, not just professional connections, but engaging with their peers and, um, and you know, especially in a in a, in a remote world or you know, where learners are taking courses online, being able to engage with their peers even though they might be in different locations and stay connected and perhaps even engage with an employer in a completely different location. Um, and that's especially really exciting when we talk about the interdisciplinary, bringing in students from different areas of study to engage on a project um, together. Or um, what I'm even more excited about these days is the cross-institutional. So bringing students from different programs from different institutions that might be in a different geographical location, uh, all working together uh, on a project that's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I know I took up my time, so I'll, I'll do this really quickly. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I think actually a blog post was posted in here. If you're interested in learning more, actually, it's Annie Lowe's uh, a story um, uh, featuring my, my my travel. So check it out. Um, come on to Ripen. You can uh, check out, learn more about us. You can reach me at Dana at Ripen.com as an employer. It's completely free to join Ripen, launch as many projects as you like. We work with over 320 higher ed institutions. So we'll start to match you and you'll be connected with one of our coordinators to start to match you to different programs and help you design projects that uh, align with your needs and, and, this, and, the, and the schools. And for educators, anyone who's interested in learning more and engaging with us, um, there are a number of programs that we have. Just reach out. I'm sure we could find a program to get you started. We can start really small all the way up to something uh, much, much, much larger. And, and many of these uh, programs right now are actually uh, funded by some of our partners, like uh, Business Higher Education Roundtable. Uh, and the last thing is any students, which goes to what you were saying earlier, any students who are interested, we have a new program we just launched called Level Up. Uh, where any student can come on and access. We have over 4,000 projects available right now. They can access a project. Uh, they're about an 80 hour project and you get paid a $1,400 stipend for completing them. Um, so please check it out, uh, level up, ripen, level up, Google it. Uh, any low, I believe is an, an employer on there as well. Fabulous. Uh, thank you for that, Dana and Annie. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who are currently students watching this, definitely take the opportunity of PBL or any experimental opportunity, learning opportunity, because it's such a great way to really showcase your skills and to start building a portfolio, whether you're a design student, a software development student, or even just a business student, because at the end of the day, when you get to the interview stage, employers always like, you know, what have you been working on that's outside your school environment or academic environment. So those projects you worked on for a short term period, whether it's four week, eight week, or 12 weeks, they are so valuable for you to showcase to employers during your interview stage or so even beyond, because it's always a great topic of conversation too. 
And for those who are employers who are watching this, definitely give a students a chance. You never know what perspective and skills that they can bring to your company. And just maybe checking out the blog post that I written for blog, um, Redfin earlier, a couple of weeks ago with their team. I really achieved and really like was receive a lot of great benefits from being a student on the platform as well as employer on the platform. And you're just able to be you know, not only give back to the community, but also be able to work with students in a more um, safer manner where the government is funding you and you are having grants to work with these students. And also to see if they're going to be a great talent for you to bring on to your company for a longer ter duration as well. And um, if you have any more questions from a student's perspective or even an employer's perspective, feel free to email me at aa.annielo at gmail.com or hello at mytravelapp.com as well. I'm more than happy to share my experience in more detail from both sides of the spectrum. Thanks, and that was awesome. Christine? I dropped my uh, email at Conestoga in the chat, as well as uh, email address for, for Seawill Canada. So um, feel free to reach out if you are interested in learning more about kind of work integrated learning in general, um, connect you to resources through Seawill Canada, or if you're interested in working with great students like Alex, then uh, we'd love to work with you at Conestoga. So um, it's in the chat, but I'm Kay Dawson at conestogac.on.ca. Thanks, Brett, for having us. Our pleasure. And Alex, we've got one minute left. Again, no pressure, man, but I, I wanted to let you do uh, your elevator pitch to sign off. And if you have, do you have a LinkedIn? Can you put that in the chat in case any employers want to connect with you? Yeah, I can definitely put that in. Uh, I don't have much of a pitch. I, I'm just existing as I am. I'm just trying to have some kind of an impact wherever I show up. And these kind of these kind of events really help me. Uh, spread spread my voice at least a little bit, hopefully bringing some of the people I know who have uh, lots of experience in their own little world, worlds out, out into the broader sense. Because I know a lot of people, especially around these times, are having uh, trouble finding uh, employment, at least at the beginning. So it's it's really nice to have that kind of stepping stone. Uh, and, and even though I didn't quite know what this was about, I'm, I'm glad I was a part of it. Well, I just put a little note in the chat. You've To sum up what you just said, it sounds like you've got an appetite for learning and making an impact. So uh, I'm sure you'd make a great addition to anybody's team. So thanks for sharing your last words. Thank you so much, Annie, uh, Christine, Dana, and certainly Alex, you for, for joining us here today. I, I hope this panel encouraged all of you listeners out there uh, to explore either bringing uh, project-based learning into your workplace or perhaps your academic institution. And I'm going to sign off now and invite everybody to head over to the uh, session for the day and final session for future wave panels for this year. Um, this one's focused on innovative will models in Canada. You're going to hear from both industry and academia again uh, on that to see how they're working together to move the needle. I look forward to seeing you there. The comments of the session point to the right one. Thank you. Bye, everyone.